Thank you, Caroline. And I need to thank Nicholas Schroeder for allowing me to swap over because um, I have a tight train schedule uh, and a, a daughter on her own in Stratford. So uh, um, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and this is the team. Um, so I'm the, um, the chief investigator on this. Melissa Grant is the principal investigator. Naomi here uh, is our trials coordinator who does all the, the biobanking and organizes us and makes sure that everything we do is ethically sound. Um, Sarah Kuna is a, is a microbiologist, so she's an expert in bacteria. Um, and Josephine Hirschfeld, who was here at last year's meeting uh, at Drayton Manor, she's our um, immune cell person. And what I hope to do is give you uh, a feel for the nature of the project and why a bunch of dental researchers are doing research into EB, because that should be a question on your minds. So um, understanding bacteria and immune cells in EB, that is what the project is essentially about, because they interact with each other, and that affects how wounds heal, whether they heal quickly, whether they heal slowly. And there's remarkably little known about the microbiology, the bugs that live on the skin uh, in EB, um, in, in areas of blistering and areas of non-blistering and in the different forms of EB. And there's even less known about the way the immune cells respond. Um, we work in this building. This is Birmingham Dental School and Hospital. It's the newest in the world at the moment. Um, and I know that's an artist's impression. The reality is um, not too dissimilar. So this is my office up here, and these are our research laboratories along the top floor here. And it was great to have Ellen, Eleanor come and visit us uh, along with Emma and, and, and see the facilities uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we do our research in this environment, and we also train uh, undergraduates and postgraduates in this environment. Uh, beautiful facilities, and this is an example of a surgery where we run our EB service, um, which is a... Um, a national adult EB service in collaboration with Adrian Hegarty, who some of you will know uh, as a dermatologist from Solihull. Um, we do get some unusual patients. This is uh, one of our patients here. She was a bit busy to come here today. There's something else happening, apparently. Um, and here she is asking us about our research and opening the building a couple of years ago. So... Um, you know this really, don't you? And I, I put these slides in in case there was anybody here that was very new to EB, um, but it's essentially a genetic uh, and a very rare genetic condition um, that causes skin blistering, both on the external skin, but also on the internal skin. So in our mouths, in our, in our um, windpipes, and in, in our swallowing tubes. And because it's genetic, it's inherited. Uh, and quite often parents don't appreciate that they might be carrying the susceptibility uh, and until their baby's born, uh, the EB doesn't become manifest as such. What's the incidence? Well, um, one in 50,000 births in the UK. Uh, we have a, essentially a, six million pop, um, a 60 million sorry, population. So around 1,200 people are affected by EB in the UK. And Deborah, of course, as you know, is the charity that looks after EB patients, provides support, provides, provides research funding uh, to try and improve our knowledge and understanding, and therefore, ultimately, uh, treatment and how we manage the disease. Now, when we talk about bacteria, um, people often think bacteria are bad things to have on our bodies. They're not actually. We need bacteria to remain healthy. And these are complicated words at the top, but symbiosis basically means a balance, means living with our bugs in harmony, and dysbiosis means things are starting to go wrong, and the bad bugs start to emerge, the bad bacteria start to emerge, and they cause problems with our immune system and also problems with wound healing. What's a holobiont? Well, a holobiont is a human being. That's what we are. And we are actually more bacteria than we are human. And so we used to think that we were 90% bacterial cells. Until about two years ago, when all of that data was re-evaluated, and we came to realize that actually, we're not 90% bacteria. We are two bacteria for every one human cell. So there are two times the number of bacteria in us as there are human cells. That's why we're called holobionts. We're a mixture of bacteria. We live with bacteria. They're part of us. And actually, this is just one of these silly facts, that if you go to the toilet and do a number two, then that ratio changes to one to one, which shows you how many bacteria live in the gut um, and how important it is to go to the toilet. 
anyhow, moving on. Um, <laughs> so we have clever methods now of measuring these bacteria, very, very sensitive molecular methods that will find these bacteria even if they're dead, and we use their DNA as a way of identifying them. And this shows you different segments of the body, the nose, the cheek, uh, different parts of the body, and each spike represents a particular named bacteria. Uh, and you can see it's really complicated, lots and lots of different spikes. But actually, what's really important is what those bacteria are doing. We don't really care what they're called, it's what they're doing. It's a little bit like a football team. If you have Jim, who's a good fo football player, and John, who's a good football player, and you have me, who's a bad football player, player and then Mel, I'm picking on you, let's assume you're a bad football player, then actually what matters is, is who plays well and who doesn't play well, and the names are irrelevant. And it's the same with bugs. Uh, there are bugs that do certain things that are damaging, and there are bugs that do certain things that are actually helpful and beneficial. And it's encouraging those good bugs on our skin uh, and the rest of our bodies that's really, really important to do. So that's the bugs. What about the immune cells themselves? Um, so white blood cells are important because they fight infection. They're also important because they actually help wounds heal. And this is a Greek slide that talks about inflammation. Um, it's a very old uh, image. Um, but basically, inflammation is a good thing when it's short-lived. We need it to, to deal with injury and to fight bacteria. But when inflammation lasts for too long and becomes chronic, then it's a bad thing. That delays wound healing and things start to go wrong and we end up with scarring uh, and adverse effects from our own inflammation from what our bodies are doing to ourselves. So why are we doing this research? Well, we're doing this research because we run an adult EB service in Birmingham. We have over 70 patients that we see on a regular basis from around the country. And we've got a long track record of researching how our immune cells work with bacteria and how they fight bacteria and how effective or ineffective they are. And the mouth, if you like, is a great model for studying bacteria and the immune system because if you think about it, the mouth is like having 28 little bones sticking out through your teeth because, sticking out through your skin, sorry, because that's what the teeth are. They're effectively bones and they're sticking out through the skin. And that's quite vulnerable. And the mouth also has the second highest number of bacteria in the body after the gut. So it's a very, very heavily colonized area for the bugs. And this is an image of a, a, a leg ulcer, a, di a diabetic leg ulcer. But it makes the point that when blisters form uh, and when they collapse uh, and you get a sort of an erosion or an ulcer forming, the bacteria colonize that. And that colonization process uh, they live in the wound, can dictate how quickly or how, how slowly that wound heals. And the other thing that those bacteria do is they get into our bloodstream and they start to interfere with our white blood cells. And those white blood cells can stop behaving properly and therefore those wounds don't heal as quickly and effectively as they should do. So that's our interest. And so it doesn't take a genius to work out that when you have ulcers with, like this, and the bacteria can colonize those ulcers, if we know which ones are good and are gonna be associated with quicker healing and which ones are bad and are gonna be associated with slower healing, then we might be able to improve wound healing significantly. Okay, mouth ulcers are no different to any other type of ulcer. And this is just a picture of the mouth and these are mouth ulcers here and down here. And this is a young 19 year old who doesn't have EB and this is a large area of ulceration here, and this is exposed bone. It's acutely painful. And this doesn't respond to antibiotics. What this responded to was an improvement in diet, increasing vitamin C levels by eating lots of kiwi fruit. And then seven days later, you can see it's starting to heal. But it wouldn't heal by using traditional anti antibacterial approaches uh, to treatment. It would only heal by improving the diet. So it's not just about getting rid of the bacteria or changing the bacteria, it's also about boosting the immune system to help it heal our, our own bodies. And this is a cartoon that shows you one of those bones sticking through the skin. So it shows you a tooth sticking through the skin. And this is health. This is incredibly rare, actually. This is pristine health. Uh, it affects about one in a thousand people. 
But the reason we have this health is because the bacteria that are living here are good bacteria that maintain a balance. And when you smile, you see the, the, the pink gum tissue you see from the outside. But actually, that's this surface here. Underneath, between the teeth and the gum, there is a crevice, a natural space, a little bit like the space between your fingers. And that's where the bacteria live. And in that space, underneath here, these tiny little holes are ulcers that form. And they form when the wrong bacteria build up. The wrong bacteria build up, they cause this long-standing bad inflammation, the chronic inflammation, and you can see how red and inflamed these gums are, and they bleed. So bad bacteria cause inflammation, and they stop the ulcers from healing. If we can change those bacteria, then we can speed up the rate at which those ulcers heal. And eventually, if you leave that process, and you still have the bad bacteria, then you don't correct that, then what happens is you get recession of the gums because it's, it's effectively like scarring of any kind of wound and the gums recede and patients are said to start looking long in the tooth. So the types of research we do in the mouth are very, very relevant to the skin. So here's the immune cell that is the most important um, in terms of wound healing and it's called a neutrophil. It's a white blood cell. And it's very, very dominant in the bloodstream. It's, it's the most common white blood cell. And if you give it the right signals, then it's a really helpful cell. It will essentially help wounds to heal. It'll clear away the bacteria, kill the bacteria, and it'll do a good job for us. But if you give it the wrong signals, then actually it starts to behave inefficiently, and it actually then starts to produce damage to our own bodies. And this is an underestimate of the type of damage that it can cause. So I've got a little video here that I'm going to click on in a minute that will show you a, a load of neutrophils trying to kill a fungal organism. And what I'd like you to look at when you watch this video is what happens to one particular neutrophil that's not behaving well. And it will appear as a red flash on the screen, which means it's releasing a load of damaging chemicals that are damaging our tissues and delaying wound healing. Could we click the video? Oh, I was supposed to do that, wasn't I? Sorry. So here it is, and if you have a look here, there is a neutrophil here, a white blood cell that is trying to kind of eat up that fungal organism, but that fungal organism is too big. And very shortly, it's going to get fed up, and it's going to die. And when it dies, it's going to release a load of damaging chemicals as this huge red flash of damaging chemicals. And if that is happening inside our tissues, it's going to damage those tissues and cause problems. So we've developed ways of measuring that process and various other processes that these neutrophils go through. And the other thing that we have um, developed is a method of measuring how quickly they, and how accurately they move towards the bacteria and kill them. And so this video here, if we can just click this one here and then the one next to it, the bacteria are up here, and the neutrophils are moving towards those bacteria. And these little colored tracks will show you that movement. You can see them moving up towards the bacteria to kill them. That's quite efficient. Those are normal white blood cells behaving normally to kill those bacteria. Let me show you some that have been exposed to the bacteria that get into the bloodstream and are starting to behave abnormally. And that's what we think might be happening uh, with EB wounds. So if we can just click on these two. The difference is quite stark. They're sort of wandering around, and they're not going in any particular direction. We say that they've lost their satellite navigation system. They can't really get to the bacteria to kill them. Um, but they're meandering around and releasing those damaging chemicals, which are actually damaging the skin or in the mouth or, or, or on, on your arms or wherever it may be. And we don't know if that happens in EB. And that's one of the things that we're looking to find out. So what do we plan to do? Um, what we plan to do is to identify all the bacteria on the skin at sites of blistering and sites of non-blistering. And then we want to look at what types of bacteria are associated with quick healing wounds versus slow healing wounds in, in the different types of EB. Um, the other thing we want to do is we want to look at the behavior of the white blood cells when the blisters are present versus when the blisters are not present. Because that will tell us if things are going wrong that, that are slowing down the rate at which those, um, those wounds are healing. 
And then the final thing we want to do is we want to look at what's inside the blister fluid because that tells us a lot about the way the immune system is working and how effective and efficient it is being at getting rid of those bacteria and facilitating uh, the wound healing. So that's the plan. Um, so we're very grateful to Deborah for the, for the funding. We have an exciting few years ahead of us. We have some wonderful patients. They're the bravest people that, and the most delightful people that, that I ever come across. Um, and if anybody here is interested in taking part in this, we will leave, some, we'll leave an email address with Caroline and the Deborah team. Just let us know because we're planning for the sampling to happen at home. It shouldn't be too difficult. We're going to set up a postal system and try and do it that way to make it easier. Um, and I think that's me done. Does anybody have any questions for Ian? Come. Oh, we have got one. Just a quick question. Do you expect to find bacteria that can fit both roles, that are pro-wound healing and anti-wound healing? That's a really good question. Um, so the bacteria live in colonies and in groups. Um, and within those groups, sometimes a good bacteria produces a food for a bad bacteria. And actually, if you knock out the good bacteria, the bad bacteria dies. So it's never that simple in science. So it's a really important question. Yes, we might find good bacteria in the wounds that actually, if we get rid of them, might result in the bad bugs dying off and the wound healing quicker. So yes. Any other questions? Thank you very much then. Thank you, Thank you so much.